Andrew, welcome to the show. Thank you, man. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, it's great to be back in touch. We were talking in the middle of, um, you know, the height of all gas, no breaks. And it's great to see that you're doing this on your own, independent. Uh, and I'm excited to hear your perspective on uh, what's going on with the new thing. For sure. So before we get into Channel 5, I'd love to hear a little bit more about, or you could, maybe you could introduce our listeners or, um, you know, or refresh people's memory about what All Gas No Breaks was, how it began, and sort of what you were trying to do with it. So All Gas No Breaks began as a uh, kind of memoir storybook that I wrote about my experiences hitchhiking across America when I was a teenager, like when I was 19. I would just like hitchhike mostly in the South and in the West Coast by myself with a recorder. I would interview like deadbeats, runaways, various like outlaw types about their life stories and, you know, triumphs and tragedies and whatnot. Uh, after a long time, I decided to propose the idea of a, an all gas, no breaks video show that I would do on Instagram and YouTube. So I found a company, a production company called Doing Things Media. And I said, yo, uh, if you guys buy me an RV, I'll go out there and make like crazy. Honestly, I first thought it'd be like a road trip show. I thought it was going to be like me focused on like gas station characters and landscapes. I didn't know what it was going to be. Then we decided I was going to go to all the craziest kind of events and explore different subcultures around the country, like furries, flat earthers, crowd boys, anarchists, all that kind of stuff. And I'd wear an oversized suit for most of the time. Uh, so this company gave me a $45,000 salary and they bought me the RV and I signed some paperwork and I had a great couple of years. Yeah. And it quickly until be- the end. It quickly became a hit. Yeah, we'll get to the uh, falling out, I think, in the second half. Um, yeah. But uh, the show became a hit. And one of the really interesting things I found was that you moved beyond just going from the Flat Earther conferences and started uh, going to, you know, some real news events. Um, yeah. And, yeah, you want, maybe you can talk a little bit about how you expanded. Well, I think right around the time of the, the COVID pandemic, I'd say around last March when things really like kicked into high gear as far as the lockdowns. That's when I started covering things that were vaguely political. I started with the um, coronavirus lockdown protest video, which was my first political video. It was like I was covering, it was the California state Capitol in Sacramento interviewing conspiracy theorists about COVID-19. That was a big hit. And I was like, damn, maybe I can do more than just funny Instagram and YouTube content. So then when the protest movement kicked off, that's when things really went into high gear. And, uh, it was, you know, during the protest, sorry, Herman Carl. It was during the protest movement uh, after the George Floyd murder. I started covering protests and riots in Minneapolis, Portland, and then Seattle. Uh, and yeah, the show just took a political turn. It wasn't like I went out of my way to be like, I'm going to make this a uh, daily show style political show. I just saw things happening and I saw a lack of news coverage. So I said, why don't we use our platform to give people voices in different walks of life? Right. And it wasn't that the news wasn't covering these events. I mean, the news was on it in the way, you know, as much as it could be, but it was doing it in the way that the news was used to, which was with a little bit of distance. And I think what was great about what you did was you got right into the thick of things and you didn't try to constrain people into sound bites. You just put a mic in front of them and let them talk. Yeah, I think that the mainstream American news cycle is locked in this just like horrible, divisive cycle of punditry, where they're like Mm -hmm. right wing talking head, left wing talking head. It's the same people who are going to propagate the exact same narratives and sell ads and make money regardless of what's going on. You know, like if anything happens, you know what Anderson Cooper and Don Lemon are going to say, and you know what Tucker Carlson and Sean Hannity are going to say. And they propagate this division because, you know, it's profitable. They're all, all these news companies are owned by the same people. I mean, the same people who own Vice own Fox News. It's basically just a news media matrix that is, exists to drive us further apart while the rich get richer. So I wanted to kind of break that. Yeah, but I think what, what happened with you was that you got into the thick of things and you came in with a different format and people really gravitated towards it. Yeah, and my format's actually the easiest format. I mean, just going in there and not saying anything is actually really easy, but no one wants to do that because they have people controlling their their voices. I mean, most journalists are controlled by higher forces, you know, higher ups who tell them what sort of narrative to push. Well, I mean, that might be one thing. I think another part of it is that our culture right now rewards certainty. You know, people don't like to live in the gray area. It doesn't get distributed the way that 
um, you know, something with black and white uh, that plays to identity might get distributed, you know, on social media. Um, and so generally people have found comfort and certainty in finding a worldview and then trying to look at everything through that prism. Um, and I think what's yeah, interesting absolutely. is that like, you know, we've talked in the past, um, I think you've mentioned to me that you're left to center, but you're still willing to like, you know, hear people out, even if they don't agree with you. And, and I find that yeah, really interesting. Totally. I mean, it's too bad that, you know, like if you are, it's hard to explain, but if you believe in one thing, you have to believe in a package of other things, right? So if you believe, if you're pro-choice and you're pro-gay marriage, like I am, then it's like, boom, you're in like the Biden camp, like you have to vote that way. But then if, you're, if you vote that way, you're also in support of like Middle East shit that Biden's into and you're in support of mass incarceration and all that stuff that Biden and the Clinton camp do. So basically, it just sucks. Like, yeah, I guess I'm center left socially, but I'm definitely not in support of the Biden administration. Right. And yeah, and I think that it's interesting because we talk about certainty, obviously certainty about the way that you view news events. But I also yeah. think there's been this other current that's occurred inside the U.S. recently, maybe the globe, which is that we view people with certainty as well. You know, a Trump yeah. voter must be A, B, and C. A Biden voter must be D, E, and F. Uh, and there's complexity to people. I think you portray that really well, where once you, you start to let somebody talk, you start to learn that they're not easily, you know, able to be packaged inside a box. And then you start to learn a little bit more about their life experiences and where they come from and mm -hmm. they don't fit neatly into this package. What do you think about that? Yeah. I mean, I think that especially the, like I said, the way we consume media, it's easy to say to loop Trump supporters or Biden voters into a prism, depending on who's telling you about these people. But the reality is that people are complex and people are stuck in misinformation bubbles on all walks of political life. People are falling victim to, to fake information and they're surrounded and bombarded with propaganda at all times. Everyone. I think social media is destroying our society. Uh, hopefully that we can last more than 50 years from now. But yeah, why do you think that? It's just putting everyone in information bubbles, man. I mean, look at the way censorship has affected the way that people talk online. I mean, it used to be that you could argue with people online about, you know, people want to act like they're just removing the fringes from the internet. No, they're removing almost a majority of Trump conservatives off of social media platforms, pushing them further into deep internet holes where they only see each other and they only talk to each other. Meanwhile, the same thing is happening, you know, with left-wing cities too. Like echo, the echo chambers are just getting more dense and it's like this infinite mosaic of bubbles and echo chambers. And it's funny because I bet that when the internet first came around, they thought that it would make us a more well-informed public because we'd have exposure to so many different worldviews and pieces of information. I mean, you have the world at your fingertips if you have a smartphone, but it's actually, I think, made people, made people like dumber and have less informational literacy. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's troubling. It's like, you can, it, no matter what you think, there's a million people online who will validate what you think whenever you decide to think it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that's sort of what playing back to the original theme that I had with certainty. Now, I don't think that there's a grand conspiracy to keep conservatives uh, off of the social platforms or that, um, you know, liberals won't be willing to listen to anybody else. Uh, but I, I do think that it is very easy to get sucked into groupthink today. And the social media platforms definitely help propel that. Well, it's not even a conspiracy to keep conservatives off social media platforms. It just is what's going on. I'll say more about you go to a Trump, If you go to a Trump rally, I mean, this is what I started noticing is that every mm. person was like, I've been kicked off. Like, that's their main beef. And I think that this loss yeah. of faith in, in tech as a social institution and free internet as, a, as an idea being a limited place, I don't know what the effects are. I mean, you know, for example, if you're involved in a, you know, like, reopen Colorado, reopen California Facebook group to end the lockdowns, you most likely get banned for medical misinformation. You know, do I think that the harmful conspiracy theories, like, uh, you know, some of them, like the, there's baby eating pedophiles with, who drink mm -hmm. children's blood to stay young forever and have lizard bloodline. Do I think that limiting the reach of that is good? Yeah, probably. But if you believe that there's some big giant conspiracy out to silence you, 
and you get silenced and so do all your friends, what are you supposed to think? Yeah, well, I do think that uh, when the social platforms went to ban QAnon, for instance, um, yeah. that did sweep out a good portion of conservatives. So there's something to that. Yeah, and you wonder what the, I guess we'll, we'll see, maybe, maybe good, maybe bad. We'll, we'll see what the long-term impact is. Because, I mean, if you get pushed off of mainstream social media platforms, I mm-hmm. feel like that validates what you already think as far as the big conspiracy. And it might even harden your beliefs and make you more militant. Yeah. On the yeah, other I mean, hand, I mean, like, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, yeah. And, but on the other hand, you know, the social media companies probably gave rise to the fact that so many people believe there is this cabal of pedophiles trying to take over the world. So it's Absolutely, a push pull yeah. for them. Yeah. But what happens is they often focus on the users and not on uh, the product itself. And so the product keeps working the way that it's always worked, but then they end up suspending yeah. people. And then there you go. You're in that position. Right. There's no right position for those tech guys. You yeah. know what I mean? They just, yeah, everyone hates here. them. Yeah. It's tough out here. Do you work in tech too? No, I mean, I'm, I'm a tech journalist, but I'm in San Francisco. Oh, uh, so, you know, reporting okay, so on this stuff like, out here. And, you know, you, I, I understand. Sales, yeah. Sorry, Salesforce you Tower, know. basically from my window. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you, yeah. can you see Salesforce Tower from your window? Because that's the metric of uh, proximity to tech giants. <laughs> if, if I lean all the way out, uh, yeah, I can get almost a glimpse of it. And, and I do really find it to be a monstrosity. Um, and there's a screen on top of it. I'm sorry to all the Salesforce listeners, but there is a screen on yeah. top of it uh, where, which they can customize and use to send messages out to the city. And sometimes they'll have the eye of Sauron on there. And I think it's a little bit, um, you know, too close to science fiction. I'm not a big fan of it. I mean, San Francisco is dystopian. I mean, look at the inequality that's propagated it's with the city failing to combat gentrification and, and provide for their homeless people. I mean, it, I can't mm-hmm. think of a place where you can have the richest people that close to just like the largest homeless encampments in the country. It's fucked up, man. Yeah, no doubt. And it's sad. And it's, there's also, um, there's a, a big willingness out here to say it's other people's fault and a reticence of course. for oh, I'm sure, to dude. actually come and jump in and, and help, which is an issue. Yeah, seeing those Black Lives Matter signs and pride flags on some of the uh, what six million dollar row homes in the Mission mm-hmm. District—that's something out of a as a dystopian science fiction novel. It's, it's depressing. Yeah, I mean, I I would say I don't think you know being wealthy should disqualify you from participating in social protests, but um, it, it it can't just be you know holding that flag out the window. Like if you want a more just you, society, if, you have to look for the economics as well. What I'm saying is if you're wealthy and you're from a, a rich family, especially if it's like Bay Area tech money and mm-hmm. you, just, you're not, you, don't, you don't live in Walnut Creek, you don't live in Piedmont, you don't live in some of the beautiful suburbs that you could live in, Palo Alto, you decide you want a little more urban living. So you move somewhere like the Mission District, which is a historic immigrant neighborhood, and you decide to take over the block. And then you think that the, uh, the optics band-aid that you're going to put is some kind of flag or, or signal in front of your thing. I don't really care what you're doing. You know, right. I mean, that's like, that's, that's colonialism. Yeah, look, no doubt. I think that um, at the end of the day, we talked a little bit about how people are complex, right? And, um, you know, and there's the certainty that we use to, to judge people. But I would also say that, like, um, it, it's important in this world, I think, to be the full package, right? Like, it, it's about the sum of actions, not about a tweet that you put out there or a sign in your window. It's about how you live your life. I think they should move their complex asses back to Palo Alto then, right? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, I I think there's something to be said for that. Um, Also, like, I think that one of the things that we, you know, we can also uh, look at is the fact that a lot of our system, we've talked about about this on the show a lot, a lot of our system is meant to preserve what those in power have. And... And it's very difficult to crack through that because of the systems that, you know, have been set up. So I agree um, with that. And that, that's, the, that's the depressing part is you can talk about it, but a lot of this stuff, it just, it just goes and goes, man. It's the machine. And I'm not like some sort of fucking, you know, anti-capitalist, like, but I'm saying it is like this machine doesn't stop urban growth and redevelopment, you know, yeah. and once it goes, it just keeps going. I'm from Seattle right now. I grew up in this neighborhood, Capitol Hill, and it's like unrecognizable. You right. Know? It's like, I'm not going to It's gone through a ton of change. It. Yeah, and you did yeah. a, a great video from the um, Capitol Hill, what is it, Autonomous Zone, Chaz? Oh, yeah, 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 Chaz, that, that shit. I, I didn't even put out most of that footage because it was just too dark. <laughs> oh, what did you see there that you didn't put out? 
Well, I mean, the main thing is like that, you know, the, the chop chats had like, I think it was three and a half weeks. And this is mm-hmm. how most autonomous zones go from what I've heard. Mm-hmm. The first week is like, everyone's got the spirit of the revolution. You know, there's like mm-hmm. lots of seminars and reading and there's clear organization. The second week, it has more of like a Coachella vibe. You know, it's like a festival. There's drum circles and fire spinners. And it looks like a, a scene from Burning Man. Mm-hmm. The third week, and I'm not sure why this happens. It's just hella tweakers, like all like the meth smokers to set up tents. And it's just like a shit show. And then the drug dealers come. And then and there was a couple st- of shootings out there. I was there for right. those shootings. It was really yeah. fucked up. I, like, w- I witnessed that. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and then the day after the shooting, I remember I was walking back to chop and this like white girl, like in full, like anarchist gear comes up to me and she goes, don't go to the park. I go, why? She goes, there's a gang war going on. And I was like, oh, there's a gang uh-huh. war going on. Okay. Where the hell are you from? I go to the park. There's no gang war, but there was like, dudes 14 year old dudes with fucking ak-47s and mm. people smoking meth on the street and doing heroin on the sidewalk you know and then the cops broke it up but i think that autonomous zones need some sort of central leadership to to exist for more than their genesis provides because you know you got to have someone being like yo we got to fucking figure this out what do you think you know so um people point to things like chop or Chaz or autonomous zones um yeah. some of the rioting that you've you've documented and they say that, you know, if this is coming from the left uh, and there's a message of overhauling the system, it's not going to win many allies. And what do you think about the fact that that can turn people off? And um, how does that sync with the political goals of the movement? Well, I mean, first of all, I just want to say the cops really gave the precinct to the protesters in Seattle. They, mm-hmm. they gave it on purpose. They wanted the people to do that i mean that was the most fortified strongest police station in right. the city the, did, so they gave it to them did and you so have, they, were yeah. you able to, to find that out through reporting or how did how do you know that? oh yeah I, all of my everyone i knew who was there everyone yeah. screaming even the city mm-hmm. reported i mean the cops uh, purposely abandoned it and were like take okay. this because they want people to do some dumb shit so they can be mm-hmm. like look they're looting and burning mm-hmm. and you know only a small percentage of protests have that element of destruction. But, you know, you know, on one hand, I understand it. Like in Minneapolis, I understood it a lot because it was like, this is the expression of the people. This is the first time they're seeing this, this imagery. And that's what you got to do to get people to listen. Initially, I understand the purpose of it. Mm-hmm. You know, just, just, just as many people came out to protest the Trayvon Martin murder, but there was no looting and no damage and no one gave mm-hmm. a shit because the reality is that the mainstream consumer public seems to care more about property damage than lives lost by police. So initially, I think that it, 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 can, it can be a good tactic to get people's attention. But I think that if their attention is already gotten, I don't see the point of continuous destruction. You know what I mean? Like yeah. months after the murder, shit, the shit going down in Portland where they're just breaking everything, to, mm. talking about the militant decolonization of the American plantation. It's like, you know, you guys maybe can do this shit here, but you leave the city, go 15 minutes outside of the suburbs. You're in the hotbed of, of militia men and all that shit. So yeah. I, I, have, I have mixed opinions on it, like a lot of people do, but I'm not like in support of fucking up small businesses or anything like that. Definitely. Right, right. And not only that, it becomes uh, very easy to clip, you know, just uh, the actions of a few people, put it on TV and use it to discredit a full movement, which... And that's exactly what happens. Um, and I did like your portrayal of what was going on in Minneapolis, um, because, you know, I think instead of... Uh, running away from what was going on, you stuck a microphone in, in front of people's faces and said, hey, what do right. you feel? And we don't even hear your framing of it. So I kind of like that. Yeah. I think that like- Thank you, I appreciate you juxtapose it. Juxtapose what you do with the news clips a lot. Uh, oftentimes there's like uh, somebody, in, in one of your video, I think it was um, Minneapolis one, where there's a, a news camera that's far away from the action. You were just inside and you start filming the news camera and you're like, what are you doing? <laughs> he's like oh hey hold on yeah. one second i'm filming the burning and you never quite get a chance to hear from the people and i think this yeah, is I know. <laughs> i'll just just wrap this and I'll let you respond to it. it's one of the plagues we have in the country right now well there's a lack of empathy you know i'm not saying you know, people need to support one another you know in terms of every single cause but you know we we very rarely will put each other uh, put ourselves in each other's shoes and would much rather demonize and i think that's an issue sorry go ahead andrew Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. You know, and I, you know, I feel the same way about almost all political causes. I mean, mm-hmm. just, just 
common ground and mutual humanity seems to be something that we've lost in a very short period of time. And yeah. uh, it's social media propagates that. Yeah, I'm right. Exactly. And I, I'm writing about this, uh, this week, it will be out on, on big technology, but the social media does have a way again of taking a multidimensional person, turning them one dimensional and having everybody believe that they know everything about them. And uh, generally it's just wrong. And, you know, people don't care about the cost of being wrong about that, which is an issue. Yeah, and so, people are people are scared to have differing opinions than than the hive that is around them. I mean, for real, mm-hmm. like as much as Trump supporters talk about, oh, cancel culture, you know, left wing group think mm-hmm. a lot of them like are scared to to have different opinions from like the Trump crowd. I mean, if someone in there mm-hmm. they they don't really have disagreements. I feel like they'd be scared to be like, hey, I actually do support abortion, or like there's tons of shit that they would not be able to like say without being ridiculed and ostracized from their community. And, and we're like that's why like. That's why all these like gentrifier like white people are so so scared of like not not appearing like as radical as possible like you know what I mean like in San Francisco and Seattle oh there's a disconnect there for sure they just want to like they they feel so guilty about what they're doing because the, deep down they know like in places like Bushwick and the Mission District mm-hmm. and and uh, in West Oakland the people who are moving in and uh, gentrifying the area they know like what they're doing so they feel like they have to be like super hardcore on social media with the infographics and with the just trying to look as hardcore as possible it's crazy man and ah oh, man oh, it's really hard to have that. A, yeah. yeah we talked about that in some degree in this show where uh, the democrat coalition right now is you know in some ways the people working in amazon fulfillment centers you know who are ju- who are judged by automated systems and fired you know if they have too much time off task they're voting in blocks together with the people who they're delivering packages to and something about that feels unsustainable Right. Yeah, I agree. What have you learned about uh, the American people? I mean, one of the interesting things um, that I find, again, talking about how people are complex, people are multifaceted. It's interesting how often people contradict themselves on your uh, on your videos. So it, when, in your new channel, it's called Channel 5 uh, with Andrew Callahan. You can watch it on YouTube. Um, you went to a White Lives Matter rally uh, and you asked some guy, you know, what's a great white food? And he goes, fish tacos, totally unironically, you know, not understanding, come on, this is a Mexican yeah. food. And then there was somebody at the, um, you went to uh, the courthouse with the, uh, while the Derek Chauvin trial was going on. And there was somebody who told you, um, they told you, I am against the prison industrial complex, but I want Derek Chauvin to rot in jail for the rest of his life. So I'm kind of curious what you learned about the American people and their, their complexities. Yeah, I mean, I don't even know. Like, I wish I could tell you. Like, I, I, I just, I document so much and I travel so frequently that I've never really had a moment to uh, sit down and think about a lot of this stuff. I mean, I think that, like, after I'm done filming for, like, a, a six more months, I think I'm just going to, like, go into the desert with, like, a, like a low laptop, like a Dell laptop, mm. and just write about all the things. that I don't know. It's, it's hard for me to process. I'm 24. I've been doing this since I was 20, you know, and... Yeah, man, this is so much going on. So many different currents running through. But I will say that uh, people seem afraid to connect with one another, you know? Say more. Like this, it's feel, I feel like it's propagated by news media and social media. There's just this... <laughs> People just are trying to get one, one another to de- demonize the other side of, mm. of the political spectrum so bad. And it's so sad because the real life implications really mean disunity. You know, and I know that we weren't ever really unified. But why does it have to be 50-50? It doesn't make any sense. Like, I'm not, I'm not trying to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but like, why is it like this? Yeah. Well, I also want to ask. Going on? Yeah, I want to ask you a question because you, you're you're among the people. How, you know, we've talked a lot about how, you know, we can blame the news and we can blame social media, but how much of this is people's responsibility on their own? You know, it's at the end of the day, it's not the social platforms or the news uh, media that's making statements or you know demonizing each other. Although I guess they play into it, but oftentimes we end up getting sucked into it. Not you and I, um, but you know the people. And I'm curious. You know, is there a level of personal responsibility here as well? Yeah, I mean, I think there definitely is, is, you know, and I think about that all the time. 
you know, are, are you were to just, are you supposed to just say that people have very poor information literacy? Or are you supposed to say that they are bigoted and they're just dumb? Or they are, I don't really know. I think it varies from person to person. I mean, I think certain people certainly are hateful and they latch on to hateful ideology that, mm -hmm. that they, because they don't like people. But I also think that most people think they're doing the right thing mm. in the world. Most Trump supporters think that they're saving America. Most people in the streets, like you know, rioting and destroying shit, believe that they are ultimately creating a, a sort of space for conversations that will better the country. I think there is, I just don't think there's that much hate. I think that yeah. there is a lot of brainwashing, but I think mm. people, people in their day-to-day -day actions think that they're doing the right thing. Everyone, not everyone, but I would say maybe 80 to 90% of people do believe that they are doing something that will be for the common good eventually. The, is there anything that gives you hope? You know, you've... No. <laughs> Just <laughs> flat out no? Uh, okay. Wow. So where do you think this goes? I don't know, man, but I'll be there. Yeah, you for, you for sure will. Okay, why don't we take a quick break and then I'd like to talk to you a little bit about your new channel. If you're Sounds good. That. I'm gonna, can I zoom back on in five minutes? Uh, sure. Okay, thanks, I'll be right back. Okay. Right, and we're back for the second half of the Big Technology Podcast with Andrew Callahan of Hello. Channel 5 with Andrew Callahan. Uh, Andrew, welcome back for the second half. Thanks. Glad to be back. I want to talk a little bit about the business side of things and what it's like for someone like you who's just starting out and sort of the, um, the potential uh, landmines you might encounter. So we talked a little bit in the first half about your relationship with doing things media. Uh, they gave you $45,000 a year salary. They gave you the RV and they said, go have at it. Uh, and why don't you pick up the story from there? Well, I mean, first, I just want to say that I have no problem with doing things media. You know, I don't want mm -hmm. people to go out and say, fuck them or whatever. It's like, just follow what I'm doing next. Because at the end of the day, yes, I signed a, a really shitty full management deal that limited my creative freedom. Not creative freedom. Yeah, fucking limited my freedom as an individual. Everything I did was owned by someone else for a long period of time. And yeah. even to this day, I can never access any of it. It's not mine. I put my heart and soul into something for two years and still someone else owns it. And someone who I have disagreements with and right. I don't, I'm not friends with. So they so, own all guys. Everything. Like, yeah, right. What, so what, what um, does everything mean? Everything I've ever done during those two years, they own. Wow. Does yeah, it extend so, beyond all gas, no breaks or? I mean, I'm, that's all I did for two years. So right. I mean, maybe if I would have made a song and put it on YouTube, they'd yeah, own yeah. it too. But you know, right. they own everything. Uh, so yeah, they gave me the RV. Um, let me do whatever I want. I mean, experience wise up until things really took off, it was fantastic. You know, yeah, it was almost fully funded by Patreon um, for a long time. What was your question? My question is, um, yeah. What, what ended up unfolding with your relationship with that? Okay. Why are so, you on your own now? So basically, you know, we, it was great for a long time. Uh, I wasn't getting any percent of the, uh, profits from patreon youtube merch anything mm. up until the show went into out of the red and into the black or the green the show started making money about six to eight months into it so for a while it was them coming out of pocket they took a gamble in the first place uh started succeeding started coming in so then they offered me uh you know 20 percent you know bear in mind i was producing the show almost entirely by myself Filming, right. researching, editing. They were just assisting with, uh, you know, some feedback here and there, but mostly merchandise, customer support is what they offered. Mm. Uh, and obviously promotion through their various pages. They'd repost me and that would drive traffic to the All Gas No Breaks page. So after a long time, you know, things took off. I was only making 20%, but I was happy with that because we were making $100,000 a month on Patreon and it, wow. the merch drops would make couple 250,000 in a day on a merch drop. So what were me, you selling merch wise? Were you like selling replicas of your big suit or? I uh, no, it was t <laughs> mostly t-shirts, t hoodies, action figures, yeah. stickers, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So dude, I was making like 25,000 a month. You know what I mean? So from where I was standing, I was like, dude, this is awesome. I mean, I was 22 years old. I was like, this is great. Uh, you know, I didn't need more. Um, then I would say around last November, December, we started working on a movie 
And uh, this movie hasn't been announced yet, but it's with Absolutely, which is Tim and Eric's production company, plus yeah. a couple other partners. We've yet to announce the movie, but I'm excited to announce it. I was wor- started okay, working cool. on the movie, started walk- working on the movie, and that, that required, you know, seven days a week. I had to work on that movie all the time. We had a new RV. I mean, we had no free time. Was it like um, a long form format of what you were doing yeah, yeah, for yeah. YouTube? Okay, cool. Yeah, a little more upgraded, a little more serious, a little more political, uh-huh. but it, it'll be an unseen. I'll, we'll talk about that when we get there, you know, because I can't say much without being under fire. Uh, <laughs> the movie, people, people were really selective about the announcement. So yeah. basically, uh, I'm working seven days a week doing this movie. And of course, the movie is going to come out in a year or something like that. That means I can't make as much content for Instagram and YouTube and Patreon. Mm. So that means doing things media got less money. Patrons started dropping, views started dropping simply because I could not make any more content. I was too busy. I was overworked beyond belief after two years on the road, segueing directly into a seven day shoot schedule for a movie, you know, and I'm only telling, I'm only saying this all because, you know, these details uh, leaked in the New York times and everything like that. I don't mm-hmm. want to spare it to the company, but uh, you know, they started pressuring me more and more to make capital C content, make this, make that. So I said to them, Hey, listen, man, I'll make more content, but I need more money at this point. I mean, you know, I was happy with 20% when I was living on the road, but I'm working on a movie full time. If, if you want me to work two jobs, I can't be getting this low amount of money for, you know, I'm, and plus they're partners on the movie. So I'm like, I'm making money for right. you. And they explained that, you know, it was more lucrative. Are you getting paid anything extra for the, for the movie? Um, yeah, but you know, nothing like I was making for the digital right. show, but okay. for, for me, it's not about the money. It's amazing it's about, by the way, yeah. that the YouTube was and Patreon was making more than the feature film. Right. But the, <laughs> the, maybe the feature film will make more money when it's released. Right. But right. at this point, I mean, I was making, I didn't care about the money, man. I, it was a passion project for me and making a movie with Tim and Eric. I was like, this is amazing. Mm-hmm. I mean, I want to devote all the time that I have to this, you know, and the digital show, obviously I love it, but I've been doing it for years. Um, I don't, I don't know. I wanted more if I was going to be 20% is not good, man. Yeah. It's not about getting rich. It's about being compensated fairly for the work that you're doing. Right. And 20% is not fair. So I said, Hey, I, I, you know, I'm happy to keep making the show, but I I need more. I needed something like 50. They said, Nope. Uh, Things got, they just wouldn't budge on that. And uh, you know, so I I I stopped making digital content. Mm -hmm. I, I stopped, but I also really couldn't. I mean, I could if I tried super hard, but I mean, and it would need to be compensated fairly and incentivized to do that, which right. I wasn't. So I'm, you know, making the movie all the time and I'm not making content. And, uh, you know, eventually they fired my two best friends, Nick and Evan, who started the show with me and filmed, you know, I remember they fired them. And then I was like, I got to get out of my contract. And then they told me that if I didn't produce two pieces of content by a certain date, that I would be fired. And then they'd find a replacement host to carry on what I built. And uh, yeah, I just got, got terminated and that was it. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I looked at the page before we recorded, there hasn't been a single video on all gas, no breaks after you left. Right. And uh, I don't think you're easily replaceable, Andrew. I think you have some real talent and uh, it's difficult to, you know, just substitute anybody in and try to have them, you know, immediately adopt the format. Yeah, and uh, I tried to say that, but you know, you know I, in a way, yeah. you know, for a long time it was really painful, you know, to mm-hmm. not to be so disconnected from something that I, when I walk in the street, people look at me and they say, "All gas, no brakes," and it's become <laughs> like a second name for me. Yeah, and just to know that that's something that I worked so hard on and put everything into that I that is not right. mine and never will be, it was hard, but it gave me more incentive to be like, okay, now I'm going to make my own thing using some of the e-commerce knowledge that I learned from working with doing things media and at, at all gas, no breaks mm-hmm. to make a sustainable, completely independent show. So now like we're fully, like I own 100% of the, the rights and the masters to everything that we make and everything goes back at into channel us. five at channel five. Yeah. Right. And it, I, I love the, I did love the title all gas, no breaks. Cause essentially it's let me put a microphone in front of somebody's face and just let them go all gas. And I won't put the brakes on, on like typical news. 
So yeah, totally. And I, I, I mm-hmm. like Channel Five even more though, because it's like yeah. it's it's kind of an evolution of what we were doing. Like I'm not trying to make a bunch of videos right. of people screaming anymore. I want to like have like a news vibe to it. I want exactly. I'm, I'm gonna get a news van, like a decal mm-hmm. old school NBC van. Oh amazing! And I'm gonna I'm gonna like change up my outfit a little bit, get like rain yeah. jackets with Channel Five on them. Like I got a lot of stuff planned to make it feel different. A lot of the videos right now are just kind of like all gas no breaks videos because yeah. I'm just trying to like retain the old audience and bounce back. Mm-hmm. But I'm gonna try a bunch of new shit. I'm gonna do streaming and like TikTok and all that. Yeah, it wasn't lost on me, by the way, that the name moved to Channel 5, because I saw that yeah. and I was like, oh, Andrew wants to do, you know, more news. And um, I think that's a good direction. I love how you, you run by another news uh, a reporter and you go, hey, are you Channel 6 or Channel 5? <laughs> oh, that was funny. Yeah, in the Miami video, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, so you, when, did, when was the termination from doing uh, the- I think it was last March. And so you pretty quickly ended up getting uh, your crew back together. Are you working with your friends again? For well, they're my, best, they're my best friend. Yeah. I mean, the, the people who made All Gas No Breaks, we live together. And we've been right. best friends since we were kids. So it's yeah. like firing them isn't going to do anything. And like mm-hmm. we, are, we are the heart of that show. And we will be the heart of whatever we do next. So lesson learned. You're working learned, together again. Yeah. Lesson learned, but lesson had to be learned. I right. mean – I don't blame doing things media at all. I have mm-hmm. nothing. I have nothing against those. those no teams. doubt. I, well, it, it does. I mean, you know, I, I think it's classy of you to, to say that, but it also, this goes to show sort of what it's like to go out and start and the different road roadblocks that could occur for someone yeah. who's ta- and, and really th- talented and wants to go out and make it on YouTube. Right. And there's no checks and balances when it comes to the ownership right. and management of uh, all these new digital mm-hmm. platforms. Like you see all these TikTok kids get exploited way, way worse than I did. Yeah. I mean, it's not like the, the movie industry where you have overtime sheets and you have stuff to really compensate you. You can be worked to death if you're mm-hmm. owned by an a, a Instagram talent management company. I was not worked to death. I, I worked myself to death. You know what I mean? <laughs> they, 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 didn't, they didn't make me do anything. They were, yeah. Creative wise, they let me do whatever I want. You know, but they are a company and they have to make money and they make money by other people making, like I said, capital C content. And I think that mm-hmm. that, tr- that idea that art and creation is another person's capital C content income creates a, a fundamental problem for independent creators. Right. And so, so tell me a little bit about how you get the crew back together. So you called your friends up and said, I want to do this, this you know, something similar uh, but on our own without a management company. And then, you know, I imagine you're going to have to get cameras and uh, a new van. So how does that operation come together without the support of an established company? I guess you well, we are some of your yeah. personal money into it. Yeah. Well, the thing is we already had a lot of uh, money. We had some money left over. I probably had like mm-hmm. $15,000 left over by the time all gas, no breaks ended. Mm-hmm. So we just went to B&H photo in New York which is a really awesome store. Everyone should check yes. out. It's in Midtown. It's amazing. And we just spent $10,000. We got cameras, microphones, and it wasn't like I even had to call them up. They were sitting right next to me. And mm. they were like, let's, let's do this. <laughs> and then we, we booked a flight to Miami and just got it in probably a month or two later. Right. And that's your first video on Channel 5 is of yes. Miami Spring Break. Yeah. It is amazing what happens when you put a microphone in front of those Spring Breakers. They do self-incriminate quite quickly. They, go, they really just go for it. You can't stop them. <laughs> they do. And so um, I think one of the interesting things is that you were able to build back your following fairly quickly. You look at All Gas No Breaks, the <coughs> YouTube page is followed by one and a half, 1.7 million people. I, last check uh, I had, Channel 5 is over 500,000 people that have followed it's right you. Right around 500,000. It's been a month and a half. So yeah, yeah, I think it was a pretty pretty good comeback given what we, oh, what my we God. went through. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing. Um, how, what was it like to see everybody start to come to your new channel? I mean, I recently discovered it, but, um, I imagine you, the YouTube algorithm that, you know, played some role in getting people back to it, but it, it's, Dude, I'm, I'm not even gonna lie. It wasn't yeah. even the YouTube algorithm. The YouTube well, has been like it? censored. I don't know. People yeah. just saw what happened to me and they wanted to mm-hmm. see what I, what I, people were like rooting for me, like an underdog. They wanted to yeah. see what I would do next. <clears throat> and I, you know, I wasn't going to lose. Right. And so, um, <laughs> with the new channel are you yeah. are you making money on it now or what's your yes, what's your plan definitely. or you're making ad money is there any other way that you're no no all of our not. stuff demonetized we only make money through patreon wait we you're have demonetized like, through youtube 
I mean, most of our videos get demonetized. Yeah. yeah and that's, like, oh, that's oh, where YouTube says basically this video goes against some of our standards. We're not going to yeah, allow yeah. creators. That's a, almost every it. video we have we've ever made has been demonetized. Which is unbelievable. YouTube. I mean, I, I think that some of the things that people say in the videos are ridiculous, but it doesn't mean that you're uh, going out <clears> and reporting on them should be demonetized. And, and our first video. Something that's not brand safe. That first video, Miami Beach Spring Break, was taken down yeah. for med medical misinformation for an entire week because someone said, fuck COVID. What? Yeah, and said so they didn't want to get vaccinated. It got taken down for a whole oh, week. Oh, right, right. There was a whole group of people saying they didn't want to get vaccinated. It's like, yeah. if these social media, I mean, I, I understand, look, I understand where social media companies sometimes need to draw the line. But the thing is, when you don't allow viewpoints to be represented, you just play into the conspiracy theories that, you know, that, uh, you know, and, and have people go, like you mentioned, to places that are, are even worse and more group think uh, yeah. oriented. And then you, you end up creating an even bigger problem. Yeah. That's like, you know, QAnon came from 8chan. People only went to 8chan because 4chan started censoring the political boards. Hmm. You, you, you try, if you follow the rabbit hole into the, the internet's, darkest most unhinged conspiratorial corners yeah you, you can trace places along the way they got censored and and basically kicked off of different social media platforms right. but andrew it, it all the, starts even the creator of of 8chan wants 8chan to be moderated in some way right i agree with that You with me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I have to go in a, a, like a two minutes here, if that's cool. Okay, yeah, yeah. So let's let's wrap with this. Um, the last question I have for you: We've talked a little bit about how social media um, has, you know, created some of this problem where we're judging people, um, you know, based off of one-dimensional views of them. We're not taking nuanced approaches to news. Uh, but then again, you've been able to build this amazing thing on social media, and a lot of people are gravitating toward it. All right, Andrew, let's uh, wrap on this. Um, we've talked a little bit about how social media has, you know, divided people, media has, but it's also um, the social media algorithms in particular have helped you, you know, reach so many people with your message, which is different. So, you know, I'm curious how you think about that. You know, do these social media algorithms have a point of view given that they've helped you rise? Or, um, you know, are we now finding that they actually do have some room for some more nuanced takes on what's going on in the world? That's a good point. I mean, I think that social media knows what you like, obviously, like, I think that's how it's helped me, you know, especially because I started pretty non politically with entertaining content. I think people mm -hmm. that like similar stuff, like maybe Sasha Baron Cohen or Nathan Fielder, or Daily Show stuff, they'll be or Tim and Eric or whatever will be kind of directed my way based upon their preferences. So in that way, I think the social media algorithm is great because it allows you to find so much stuff that you think is hilarious that you may have otherwise not been able to find or have access to. Like I, I'm happy for the algorithm in the way that it's made me been able to find other creators and link with people across the world. Like I don't think social media is bad. I think that when you uh, get locked in a social media news bubble and become politicized, that's when it's bad. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that's when the algorithm needs to be worked on. Otherwise it's very helpful and you could say transcendent. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And that's, uh, that's a word I would use to describe your show. So thank you again for making it. It's, uh, you can find it by searching on YouTube channel five with Andrew Callahan. Yes, yes, right? you can. So channel, yeah, for go sure. Ahead. Channel five uh, on Patreon also, it's five bucks a month. That's where we post all of our stuff early. And if you want to fund the project, get some un uncut, uncensored episodes, you can check it out there. But for most stuff, yeah, just YouTube. Channel 5 with Andrew Callahan. Terrific. Well, Andrew, it's always great to talk. Thank you for being a friend yeah. of the show, a friend of big technology. 
And I can't wait to see what you do in the future. It's, uh, it's been wild so far. And I think you're really hitting a nerve. So um, thank you. I appreciate you having me on, man. Yeah. Looking forward to seeing what's next. All right. Till next time, my friend. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks everybody for listening. Thanks to Nate Gwatney for doing the editing road circle for hosting and selling the ads. We will see you next week here on there the we Technology see it, Podcast. Bye, Andrew. Yeah. Peace.